Hi everyone, my name is Michał Trajanowski and I'm from Curity. I would like to talk to you about the security best practices concerning JSON Web Tokens. First, I will quickly go over the basics of JOTS and then focus on the 11 best practices, which are JOTS used as access tokens, best practices concerning signing and encryption algorithms, when to validate the token, why we should always check the issuer and audience claims, check whether the tokens are used as intended, how to deal with time-based claims, how to work with the signature, when can you use symmetric signing, a few notes about PPI, which is pairwise pseudonymous identifiers, and finally, why it's not a good idea to use JOTS for sessions. Let's make a quick introduction into JOTS so we're all on the same page. JSON Web Tokens are lightweight tokens which are meant to be passed as HTTP headers or in query strings. And probably not surprisingly, they're encoded as JSON. Each token consists of different parts depending on the type of the token, but they will also have at least the header and some payload in the body. Just can be encrypted, signed or neither. Encrypted tokens are known as JWE and signed tokens are called JWS. Let's also remember that although they're very popular, they're not the only kind of tokens allowed by the OAuth specification. Let's dig in. So what should you remember when using JOTs as access tokens? JOTs are by-value tokens, which means that they contain data. Even if you can't read it with your own eyes, it's still there. A JOT can easily be decoded into JSON and its content read. Whether it's a problem or not depends on the intended use of the token. It's okay for an ID token. You want it to be decoded by the client's developers to use the data inside of it. But the data inside of the access token is meant for the resource server and the client's developers should not use it, but they probably will. This should make you consider a few things. Developers can base their solutions on the data which is inside of the JOT. If you decide to introduce breaking changes, for example, you remove a field, this can cause many integrating apps to stop working. As anyone can read what is inside the token, privacy should be taken into account. If you want to put sensitive data about a user in the token, or even personally identifiable information, remember that anyone can decode the token and access this data. If such information can't be removed from the token, you should consider switching to either the phantom token approach or the split token approach, where opaque tokens are issued to the client, but they are then exchanged for JOTs, which can be consumed by the API. In these approaches, the client never has access to the JOT, so they can't read the sensible data. Users' private data is not the only information that can't be leaked in the JOT. You have to be careful not to provide any sensitive data about your API in the token. Anything that could help an attacker breach your defenses. Access tokens are most often used as bearer tokens. That means that you accept the token from whoever presented it to you. It's pretty much like paying with cash. If you find a $10 bill lying in the street and pay with, with it for a coffee, it will be accepted, as long as it's a genuine banknote, and nobody will ask if you're really the owner of the money. The same applies to bearer access tokens, and if that could pose a problem to your application, you can change a bearer token into a holder of key token, which is more like a credit card to hold to the analogy. You can do it by adding a CNF claim, a confirmation claim, and the claim can contain, for example, a fingerprint of the client certificate. Which cryptographic algorithms should you use? Whether the token is signed or encrypted, it will contain an ALG claim in the header of the token. And the claim will contain the algorithm that was used to either sign or encrypt the token. It is a good practice to whitelist those algorithms. This can prevent an attack where someone would tamper with the token and trick you into using a less secure algorithm. In a worst case scenario, they could trick you into using the non-algorithm, which would mean that the resource server would not check the signature at all. It's much better to whitelist than blacklist because it helps you prevent some case sensitivity issues. 
there was an attack on an API that used the fact that the algorithm none with a capital N was interpreted as algorithm none, but was not on the blacklist, so it was accepted by the API. You should also remember that the none algorithm is a special case. It tells the resource server not to validate the signature at all, so using it is not recommended, unless you're really sure what you're doing. There's an RFC titled JSON Web Algorithms, which lists all the different cryptographic algorithms which can be used to either sign or encrypt the token. It also gives recommendations on which algorithms should be used based on the current state of knowledge in cryptography. When it comes to signing, three algorithms are recommended. For asymmetric signing, it's the ES256, which is the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm using P256 and SHA-256, and RS-256, which is the RSA signature algorithm defined in version 1.5 of the PQCS number 1 using SHA-256. The latter is much more popular in the industry, but is much slower than the former. So if, if you have a choice, go for the ES-256 option. If you're stuck with symmetric signing, which is not really recommended for a few reasons that we'll talk about, you should use the HS-256 algorithm, which is the HMAC using SHA-256. When to validate the token? The rule of thumb is you should always validate in an incoming job. It's pretty obvious in the public settings, where you have your authorization server, APIs and clients connected via the internet, but even you have, if you have a private settings, so all your clients, the authorization server and the APIs are within a private network and not using the internet, you should still maintain a high level of security. At some point in the future, you may want to move to the public domain and start using the internet as your transport layer. Experience shows that in such case, it is very easy to overlook the fact that the threat model has changed and that you should consider different security solutions. But if you have those solutions in place from the beginning, it's not a problem then. Validating the token in all situations can also help you in case someone manages to break into your network or where you would have a malicious actor in your, in your organization who would forge tokens to gain access to some resources. The one case where you could consider omitting checking the signature of the token is when you get the token in the response from the authorization server, but only if it's sent in the body of the response. If you get the token in the URL, you should still validate the signature as in this case, there's a greater risk that someone has tampered with it. Always check the issuer. If the JOT contains the issuer claim, ISS, you should always check that it contains the value you expect. Check the value against the whitelist, whether it's an issuer that you know and trust. If you don't recognize the value of the issuer, you should reject such token. The value of the issuer should also be used to verify the ownership of any keys or certificates you use to verify the signature or to decrypt the token. How you check this ownership depends on the implementation. For example, in OpenID Connect, the value of the issuer must be a URL using the HTTPS scheme. Thus, it makes it much easier to verify the ownership of a certificate or a key. It is a good practice to use URLs as values of the issuer claim but if a plain string is used, you should then check with the authorization server documentation how exactly can you verify the ownership of the, of the certificate or the key. You should also remember that the value of this claim must match exactly the value which you expect. For example, if you receive a token which in the value of the issuer claim has a domain with a path and you expect it to have only the domain, it's not the same issuer and you should reject such token. Always check the audience. Another claim that should be checked against a whitelist by the resource server is the audience claim, AUD. The resource server should check if the value of the claim is one that the server is part of, and it should reject any tokens that have values not recognized by the server. This helps to mitigate attacks where one resource server would receive a legitimate access token that was intended for it but then try to use this token to gain access to another resource server that it shouldn't have access to. If the JOT is an ID token, the audience claim should contain the client ID. So the token is intended to be used by the client and it shouldn't be used by anyone else. 
unless the audience claim contains other values, which is possible. When it comes to access tokens, the good practice is to use the URL of the API that the token is intended for. Check if tokens are used as intended. Jots can be used as access tokens or ID tokens, or sometimes even for other purposes. It's important that the resource server should always check whether the type of the token is the one that it expects it to be. So, for example, it shouldn't accept an ID token as an access token and give access to resources based on an ID token. How you differentiate the tokens depends on the implementation of the authorization server that you use, but here are some examples. You can check whether the token has the scope claim. An ID token won't have it. So if you check that there is a scope claim in the body of a JOT, that should be an access token. As we've shown before, you can check the value of the audience claim, as this claim should have different values for access tokens and ID tokens. Curity Identity Server sets a purpose claim and gives it a value of either access token or ID token for the respective types. And some servers can have different other implementations. For example, there's a not yet standardized type claim, which will be added to the header of the JOT, and for access tokens, it will have the value AT plus JOT. So if your server implements that, you can use it to differentiate the tokens. Dealing with time-based claims. JOTs are self-contained by-value tokens, which are very hard to revoke once they are issued and delivered to the recipient. And because of that, you should always consider using as short expiration values as possible in, uh, for the tokens. And we think of minutes or hours here, you should definitely avoid using days or months inside the expiration claim. And I think it goes without saying that the resource server should reject any token that is past its expiration value, which is present in the AXP claim. But the EXP claim is not the only one which, uh, which contains a time-based value. The NPF claim stands for not before, and it says that the token shouldn't be considered valid before the given time. The resource server should reject the token if uh, the current time is before the value which is in this claim. Another time-based claim is the IAT, which stands for issued at, and this is the time when the token has been issued. The resource server can use the value of this claim to reject any token in deems too old to be used, even if the token is not after its expiration, expiration time. When working with time-based claims, you have to remember that server time can vary between different machines. And because of that, you should consider using a clock skew when working with time-based values. A few seconds should be enough here, and using more than 30 is definitely not recommended, because that would mean that there are rather some problems with the server itself, and it's probably not a common clock skew. How to work with the signature. In a signed JOT, the signature is used to sign not only the payload, but also the header. This means that any change in either the contents of the body or the header will result in a different signature. This doesn't even have to be a change in the values of the fields. In this example here, the only thing that has changed is the order of the fields in the header. And as you can see, that was enough to generate a different signature. This also means that if there are no differences between two tokens, the signatures will be the same. So the authorization server could generate two different tokens, but with the same values for all the claims. That of course means that they would have to have the same subject, audience, etc. And even be generated in the same second if they contained the issued add claim. And these two different tokens would have the same signature. To mitigate this problem, many JOTs have a JTI claim, which is a random ID. This randomness assures us that the resulting signature will be different, even if all other claims would have the same values. To properly validate a signature, the resource server needs a key or a certificate. These can be obtained from the authorization server in a few different ways. For example, you can get the keys from the authorization server administrator in an onboarding process and distribute them to all your service instances. But it can become cumbersome should the keys change and you have many such instances. 
So a good practice is to always dynamically download the keys or certificates from an endpoint exposed by the authorization server. You should probably cache the response based on what the server tells you though. This allows for an easy key rotation and you can be sure that such rotation will not break your implementation. The URL that you download the keys from or the certificates can either be a well-known endpoint defined by the OpenID Connect specification, or it can be present in one of the claims in the token itself and inside of the header. It will be the JKU claim if it's a URI of the public key or the X5 view claim if it's the URI of the certificate chain. The public key or certificate can also be sent together with the JOT in the header. It will be sent in the JWK claim if it's a public key or a X5C claim if it's a certificate. However you get the keys or certificates, you should remember to always validate their ownership. Either check against the issuer claim if it's a URL, against the whitelist if it's a public key in the JOT or by checking the trust chain if you have a certificate. When to use symmetric signing? The rule of thumb here is don't use symmetric keys for signing. There are probably not many use cases in which symmetric signing would be justified, and it adds complexity and reduces security. One of the problems is that all parties must share the key, which means that the more services there are that need the key, and the more instances of those services, the more complicated it gets to rotate the keys, and the more probable that someone somewhere will eventually leak the key. Another issue with the symmetric signing is that anyone can sign the token. When using asymmetric signing, then you can be sure that only the issuer can sign tokens. Other parties can only validate them. When using symmetric signing, anyone with the key can also sign tokens, which again lowers the security. If you're stuck with using symmetric signing, at least try to use ephemeral secrets, thus increasing the security level. Pairwise pseudonymous identifiers. The OpenID Connect standard introduces PPID, pairwise pseudonymous identifiers. It's a solution which protects the user ID. It's useful, especially in situations where you use some meaningful and sensitive data as the ID, for example, a social security number. When using PPID, every client gets a unique obfuscated user ID. This way, you do not only protect the data used for the ID itself, but you make sure that different clients won't be able to correlate the user's data. Do not use JOTs for sessions. There are resources around the web that tell you how to use JOTs as session storage mechanisms. Although that is feasible, it is not considered a good practice. JOTs were never designed with sessions in mind, and using them for this purpose can actually lead to security issues. If you're interested in more details, you can easily Google this topic. And that are all the JOT best practices I wanted to share with you today. Let us know if you have any questions or comments. Thanks for watching.